community has always been a big part of our church, and it's not just because we all need friends, and we do, but it's because the Bible teaches that community is the best context for our spiritual growth. There's a great passage in Acts chapter 2 that says that all this, as the new community of believers was being formed in the New Testament, it says that they devoted themselves to several things, to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then it says a little bit later that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So you got this growing community where people devoted themselves to the fellowship. And they also were an inclusive community they, as they brought new people in. So we're going to talk about community. And what I'd like to do is talk about some of the ways that people approach community today. And for this, I would reference the noted author Henry Cloud, author of the book Changes That Heal, where he talks about four ways that people approach community. Now, when he's talking about it, he's using words like um, healthy attachment to others or bonding. And the premise there is that when we have healthy attachments in our life, good things happen to us, healthy things happen, because we're well connected and God made us for that. So it's really good to think about this question, how, do I, how am I at having healthy attachments with other people? How well do I bond with people? So let's look at these four ways uh, that people approach community. The first way is uh, isolation. And uh, there are times in our lives when some of us are hesitant to be part of a community. There are things that hold us back. So why do people choose isolation? Well, one reason is that community can feel risky. Uh, another reason is that some of us actually may have been hurt in the past by uh, prior communities that we've been a part of. And uh, sometimes we just don't want to um, reveal our, our, our true selves or just sort of go to the trouble and the energy of entering into communities. So that's, that's some of the reasons that people choose isolation. Uh, there was a, a great song by Simon and Garfunkel back in the 60s where it's called I Am a Rock. And the words go, I am a rock, I am an island. A rock feels no pain and an island never cries. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons that we want to sometimes avoid the risk of relationships. But God, God didn't make us for isolation. He made us for relationships. So we need to move beyond isolation. The second way that uh, we enter into community is something that we might call pseudo-community. And what this looks like is we begin to get around people, but we hide our true selves. And so what are some of the reasons that we might do that? Well, I've noticed even in my own life sometimes that when I get into a new community, I, I want to be accepted, and so I put on the norms of the group. And sometimes we just want to, we, we just want people to know our good parts. We don't want people to know uh, our bad parts, our weaknesses, our struggles. And so uh, sometimes we get in a community and we pretend or we fake it or we don't let people see our real selves. But after a while, faking it can be tiring. It really can. It just, ta it just takes work to fake it. And our hearts long for honest relationships, an honest community. We want to be a part of something that is real and where, where our real self can be brought out into the light and be loved. So we've got to watch out for pseudo-community, uh, but that occurs for all of us. The third way that uh, people approach community is what we're going to call negative community. Negative community. And this is community where that... And, and maybe you've seen this. Maybe you've been a, a part of a church where this has happened, where things, where people start to use unkind words, where gossip uh, becomes more prominent, um, and it just is, is kind of a divisive community. 
Now, why, why do people fall into negative community? Because I've seen it over the years. And I think one of the big reasons is we, um, every community that we're ever a part of eventually will let us down. We have, we have hopes, we have dreams, we have ideals, and we want the community that we're a part of to live up to those ideals. You know, in our membership class, we, we uh, emphasize the idea, this idea of mind the gap, which is a, a phrase from the UK when they use in their, their underground system in London. But basically, all of us need to be aware that there is a gap between the ideal and the real, real. But some of us, when we notice that gap, we get disappointed, we get, we get judgmental, we, we, we actually start, we can become destructive. And that's what we mean by negative community. So and there's reasons that we fall into that. Um, I've fallen into that myself. There's reasons why that happens. But we've got to watch out for that because really, um, we were made for loving community, loving community. So that's what we aspire to in our church. It's one of our core values is loving community. So the fourth way I think that we uh, enter into community that we really hope that we will all learn to grow in is what we might call gospel community. The gospel is the good news that God saves sinners through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. So what that means, in a, in a gospel community, there are rich amounts of both grace and truth. It says in John 1.14 about Jesus that he was full of grace and truth. So what does that look like? Well, rich amounts of truth mean, would mean that I'm part of a community where we read the Bible and we study the Bible together because we want to learn God's truth, but we also wish to learn the truth about ourselves. What do we mean by rich amounts of grace in a community? Well, that, that refers to love and support and care. One of, the, one of the things that I think is really important about grace and community is that when somebody lets me down, I maintain what we call a for you posture. Romans 8, 31 talks about how if God is for us, who can be against us? And he gave his son, even when we were sinners. God remains for us, and so we need to remain for each other. We had a, uh, Molly and I some years ago experienced a great example of this because we were bringing some new people into a community in our home where we had dinners and we could discuss and explore the gospel. And uh, we invited a, um, a mutual friend who wasn't part of any community. And she, she came into this group and she began to, to test the limits of that community. She would, she would cuss, she would talk about honest things. And, uh, and, and in that community, we just laughed. We were honest, we were real, and it was a safe place for people to talk. And I remember her going back to some mutual friends and she said, she said, is this what Christian community is like? It is a fabulous thing when we can taste gospel community. So I wanna close by suggesting a few things that that you can do to help build a gospel community, but whether it's just in your church at large or in your community group. What are some things that we all can do? So the first thing I'd recommend or urge you to do is to work to internalize the gospel for your own heart. That happens in worship, that happens in stuff that you read, it happens in, um, in even in your community group. But be on a lifetime journey of learning to understand the gospel and apply it to your own heart, because that'll give you something to bring in the community. Secondly, study and discuss the Bible in your community group. Fellowship is more than just being united around sports or politics or weather. Actually, it's about learning God's word together. So make sure you have time for the truth of God's word to be discussed within the group. The third thing that we can all do is to be vulnerable in safe settings. And one of the ways we can do this is when we share prayer requests. Um, it's, it's really interesting to think about 
a lot of times when we share prayer requests, of course we've got our sick aunt in Arizona and a lot of stuff we can talk about. But what would it be like if you thought of a prayer request that related to a growth area in your life, something that God is teaching you? What if you had the freedom to acknowledge a fear or a weakness and to ask for prayer? That's, that's what we mean by vulnerability, not a weird, inappropriate vulnerability, but one that says, this is what's happening in my heart. Would you pray for me? Another way to contribute to gospel community is to, when, when other people are sharing, to listen, to express empathy, and to resist the urge to fix them on the spot. Because that, that just shuts down their honesty. One of my favorite uh, movie scenes about community is in the, um, it's a pretty old movie now, Notting Hill where they had some people gathering around for dinner and everybody had to share a story of what was hard about their life that week. And the person that had the hardest week got to have the last brownie at the end of the meal. And it's such a cool scene of people being honest and people being, being vulnerable. Gospel community, what you can do, what can you do? Practice forgiveness because there will be times when individuals in your group will disappoint you, they will let you down. And the Bible says to be tenderhearted, forgiving toward each other, just as God and Christ has forgiven you. That's what's beautiful about the gospel. When I look at how I've been forgiven, I can forgive others. And then finally, practice love. Practice love in the community. First uh, Peter says, chapter 4 and verse 7 says, and verse 8 says that love covers a multitude of sins generous amounts of love in a community, overlooking the faults and the weaknesses of others. I'll close with this thought. There was a, um, a recent book written by David Mathis called Habits of Grace. And one of the things he says in there is that fellowship or community is one of the spiritual disciplines. It is a means of God's grace. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way that God encourages us and shapes us and challenges us and changes us. Listen to what he says about fellowship. He said, fellowship may be the forgotten middle child of the spiritual disciplines, but she may save your life in the dark night of the soul.